In my last video, I talked about the blue Ferraris in Formula One and how those messed a lot of people about because usually Ferraris are red because of national racing colours. Red for Italy, or Rosso Corsa as it's more commonly known. You've got British racing green, the Americans using blue with the white stripe, and the Germans using white and later silver. But then in 1968, those colours started disappearing, when Colin Chapman's Lotus cars turned up at the South African Grand Prix, painted not in the traditional green, but in red and gold. Colin had sold the car's colour scheme to Imperial Tobacco, and they used this to promote the Gold Leaf Tobacco brand. This trend was then copied by other teams, as space on cars was sold to the highest bidder. In the days of national racing colours, there would be logos on the cars, but these were the tyre companies, the spark plug companies, the oil companies, the petrol companies, not the actual logos of products that people would actually buy. But in 1968, Formula One entered a brand new era. The cost of running a Formula One team in 1968 had reached the £100,000 mark, equivalent to around £1.5 million today. Imperial Tobacco's payment to Lotus for that 1968 season was 100 grand, which meant Lotus's budget was covered for the season, and it would have meant that Graham Hill and other drivers could pocket more in the way of prize money. They say that Jackie Stewart was the first to take advantage of this, being that he was the guy that was up and coming into the beginning of the 1970s, but Nicky Lauda was the one that really cashed in on it when he went to Ferrari. Soon, logos of whoever was paying would turn up on cars, mostly tobacco companies thanks to the bottomless pit of money they offered, but there was perfume brands, watches, and even the logo for a condom company appeared on a car. Budgets went up, salaries went up, and the profile of the sport went up, especially when Bernie took over the commercial rights and took the sport to international television. And these sponsorship deals were lifelines for the plucky upstarts that wanted to try and make it to the promised land of Formula One. While the likes of Hesketh could rely on the personal wealth of the team's founder, as Formula One entered the 1980s, the back of the back of the grid team, so the ones subjected to the embarrassment of having to pre-qualify for every race, would have sponsors as ways of making sure the team survived race to race. This was the reason why a lot of privateer teams from the 80s and into the 90s had a small Marlboro logo somewhere on the car, this being because the unknown Italian pay driver they brought in had Marlborough as a sponsor. Marlborough then is like Red Bull today. But this carried its own risks. Some of these teams would be so desperate for cash they would take on literally anybody. And they'd often be partnered with somebody who didn't have the cash that they promised, the people that they were working with were members of a criminal enterprise, or the person they were with was operating a straight up scam. And this is what happened to Arrows in the late 1990s. Arrows was set up in 1977, the brainchild of Franco Ambrosio, Alan Rees, 1969 Le Mans winner Jackie Oliver, Dave Wass and Tony Southgate, and the name Arrows was derived from the surnames of the five men involved, although they whacked an extra R in there to make sure the name made sense. March did the same thing with their name, Mosley, Alan Rees, Graham Coker, Robin Hurd. Funnily enough, Alan Rees was part of both March and Arrows. Robin Hurd would go on to form the Simtech team in the mid-1990s. Arrows was one of those teams perpetually in the midfield, but had their odd flash of brilliance. In their early history, their big moment was that Ricardo Patrese, in an early Arrows car, was part of, if not the cause of the crash that later claimed the life of Ronnie Peterson. Patrese was tried by a kangaroo court led by James Hunt and Nicky Lauda, but later exonerated by the Italian courts. Their first taste of success came at the 1985 San Marino Grand Prix, when Thierry Boutsen finished third, only for Prost's car to be disqualified for being two kilos underweight, which gave the team a second place instead. Either way, it was their first time on the podium, and despite most of the original founders leaving by the end of the decade, Arrows gave a break to Ross Braun in 1987, which led to 87 and 88 being the best years for the team, helped by drivers Eddie Cheever and Derek Warwick. But going into the 1990s, a Japanese businessman called Wataro Ohashi invested in the team, leading to Arrows being called Footwork in 1991. But the heights of the late 80s were hard to come by, as money became tighter and tighter over the years, as admitted by Gianni Morbidelli, who was the most successful driver for the team in this period. The team had to rely on paid drivers due to Ohashi's money drying up, and Oliver having to fund the team from his own pocket. It's why Max Pappas was brought in and Morbidelli kicked out midway through 1995. They also hired Taki Inui, a man who was run over by a medical car during the 1995 Hungarian Grand Prix. Oliver and Rees bought back their shares from Ohashi with help from a German finance company called... Um... This. Look, I'm not even going to bother trying to pronounce that. The first word I might get after a while. The second part, easy. It's just finance with a German twist. But the third part... No. 
Not happening. Footwork sounds like a shoe company, doesn't it? Like they make sort of like Nike Air Jordan type of things or some other type of sports shoe, trainer, sneaker, whatever you want to call it. But in reality, it was a logistics company and the whole company was liquidated in the early 2000s when it turns out that Ohashi was the center of a fraud scandal. In 1996, the team changed owners. After a failed attempt at buying out the Ligier team, Tom Walkinshaw took the controlling stake of what was still called footwork at this point. In 1996, the team scored a single point, scored by Jos Verstappen at the Argentine Grand Prix of that year. Ligier would win the Monaco Grand Prix. It was a season plagued with retirements, and Footwork was the last of the point scorers that season, ahead of only Minardi and Forti. In 1997, TWR Arrows, as it was now, was on the grid in the striking blue and white livery, taking on 1996 world champion Damon Hill and using Pedro Deniz with his family's wealth and connections to pay Hill's salary. Damon would almost win that year's Hungarian Grand Prix, and while he was able to prove he could be competitive without an Adrian Newey car, he would be off to Jordan the following year, and TWR's ambitions of turning Arrows into a championship contending team started to fall apart. So fast forward then to 1999. John Barnard, who had joined in 1998, left the team after a single year and was replaced by every IT department's worst nightmare, Mike Coughlin. Zack Speed, who had run cars in Formula 1 before and also in endurance racing, had attempted a $40 million buyout, but they couldn't come to an arrangement, so TWR turned up on the grid in a striking orange, black and white livery. This was all due to the drivers they had on board. Pedro De La Rosa, who would go on to become the world's greatest test driver and, like Coughlin, be pretty bad with emails, and Tarana Suki Takagi. Both of them brought a much-needed injection of cash, particularly as De La Rosa brought money from Repsol, the Spanish petrochemical company, and Takagi brought money from PIAA. Now, I never knew what PIAA was until just now, even though it had been on the Tyrrells the previous year and the year before that as well, because Takagi was Tyrrell's test driver in 1997. PIAA is a Japanese car parts manufacturer, and it's not spelled out as PIAA, it's actually PIA. It's onomatopoeic rather than being an acronym. Something to do with the Japanese language, but that's as far as I got into that rabbit hole. But also on the car displayed prominently on the side pods was T Minus, a brand that had turned up at the start of the season, but by about sort of three quarters of the way through the season, had disappeared. The man behind this T Minus brand was called Malik Ado Ibrahim, who claimed to be a prince in the royal family of the Igbira people. Now, firstly, I do apologize for any cock ups in pronunciation to any Nigerians watching, and secondly, isn't there like 70 different royal families in Nigeria? So, when someone says something like that, there is the possibility of truth. Vice.com can take credit for this line. It's not like Prince William had turned up and said he's going to put some of his nan's money into your racing team. Well, it's his dad's money now, isn't it? I can't be the only one still calling him Prince Charles and singing God Save the Queen at this point, can I? Either way, whether he was telling Porky Pies or not, Prince Malik was saying he'd got 125 million to put into the team, which is going to make anybody sit up and take notice. London-based private equity bank, try saying that three times fast, Morgan Grenfell, was pulled in to help Malik broker the deal with Arrows, and this gave him anywhere between 10 and 30% of the team, although the numbers will vary depending on which article you read. One article puts the share divide at Walkinshaw with 25%, down from 40, Prince Malik at 25%, while Morgan Grenfell took the remaining 45. And Arrows seriously needed the cash. They had been trying to take Pedro Diniz to court for alleged breach of contract when he took his Brazilian supermarket money to Sauber, while all through 1998 Arrows had been building their own engines because they'd bought out Brian Hart's engine company. The losses for 1998 were astronomical, nearly 6 million quid. In 1997, they'd lost something like 250 grand. De La Rosa was able to score a point at the season opening Australian Grand Prix, a race that would be won by Ferrari's Eddie Irvine, but the car was an absolute dog and only a marginal upgrade over the 1998 car, and Arrows were struggling to better Minardi in qualifying. But they could use Prince Malik's money to make the car better, right? No. Simply because that money didn't exist. The T-Minus brand was supposed to raise money through an energy drink and selling rebranded products like cars, clothing and motorbikes. What I assumed was going to happen was that T-Minus would buy something like a Harley Davidson or a Ducati or a Kawasaki or whatever it might be, rebadge it and then sell it as their own thing. Apparently a deal with Lamborghini had fallen through not long before he got in contact with Arrows but that might have just been part of the sales pitch. 
By the time the season reached the Hungarian Grand Prix, Malik had disappeared with no one knowing where he'd gone. Again, this all depends on which article you read, because I've got one here that says he was kicked out, and the other saying he legged it. But one bit does remain a fact. Arrows didn't receive a single penny. They had to take out massive loans with Morgan Grenfell to cover the losses, which would contribute to the downfall of the team over the next couple of years. But Arrows was able to soldier on a tiny bit longer. Takagi left the team at the end of 1999 due to communication problems, he couldn't speak English basically, and Jos Verstappen was brought back to the team for the first time since 1996. On top of this, the team was backed by the French telecoms company Orange, which provided one of the cult liveries from the time. The 2000 car was a big improvement on the 1999 car, often fastest in the speed traps, but just unreliable. The team would score 7 points and be 7th in the standings, ahead of Sauber, Minardi, Prost and even Jaguar, who had Ford money behind them. Verstappen would be 4th at Monza, and the team got a double points finish at Canada and Germany. But Paul Stoddard, who had been back in the team through his European aviation company, decided he was taking the money to Minardi instead, with a view to take over from Giancarlo Minardi. On top of this, Eurobet, another sponsor which was owned by Morgan Grenfell, had made massive, massive losses, so they were out. Red Bull, meanwhile, agreed to put more money into the team on the condition that Enrique Bernaldi come in to replace Del Rosa and be partnered with Verstappen. In 2001, they scored a single point, Verstappen at Austria, and they were unable to do any testing due to limited funds. On top of this, Verstappen famously binned Montoya out of the Brazilian Grand Prix. But then it was the end for the team. In 2002, the team had to use an engine built for Jaguar, and then they had to pay the Dinis family $700,000 in compensation and legal fees. Then, Verstappen sued them for breach of contract when Frentzen was signed to replace him. Prost was gone, Minardi was on life support, and Arrow's in deep trouble. It was only a matter of time before Jordan joined them. The privateers were slowly being forced out of Formula 1 due to the massive increase in manufacturer backing. Arrow's also had an outstanding $7 million bill for engines that it couldn't pay but two lifelines were found. One from Craig Pollock of BAR, and the other was Dietrich Mateschitz of Red Bull. But Walkinshaw was asking for too much money for what was left. The German Grand Prix of 2002 would be the last race for the Orange Boys. Because the team had gone into administration, Max and Bernie kicked them out of the 2002 World Championship. They did try to get back onto the grid for 2003, but it just was not to be. Paul Stoddart bought the remaining assets to help develop the Minardi car into 2003 and into 2004 to ease the load on Minardi's finances. Those cars that they'd been developing through 2002 and into 2003, at Arrows that is, ended up being the Super Aguri cars in 2006. So where did Malik end up? According to Vice, in 2008 he was in court on charges of stealing money intended to help an up-and-coming NASCAR driver. He was cleared of those charges, but he was unable to leave the jail in Texas he was being held in because he couldn't post his $35,000 bail. The bail was in place because he'd been done for perjury during that same trial. Then, while on probation, a warrant was put out for him by a judge in Texas as Malik had allegedly stolen $200,000 during his probationary period. And during this time, he was working for a renewable energy company. In 2017, when Vice wrote its article on Malik, he was working for a green energy company called Nigus. What he's doing now, nobody knows. The thing is, Malik has never talked about his time in Formula 1 since he left. Maybe he just wants to forget about it and move on with his life, or potentially help other people forget that he was ever in Formula 1. Maybe he thought the T-minus thing would actually work, but the only T-minus that was actually happening was the countdown to Arrow's extinction. They took a massive gamble on getting cash injection that just... well, never happened. So then, a look at the Team Minus saga from 1999. If this has taught you something or cleared something up, maybe you saw this at the time and wondered what it was, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help out at a more personal level and contribute to the picture purchasing piggy bank, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and my affiliate links. Well, there's super thanks down there if you just want to do a one and done donation or memberships if you want to be more overt with your support. So until next time, I've been Ada Millward. Have a great day wherever you are and goodbye.